Uh, like I said, I hope you're all enjoying your week and your summer. And tonight we are going to uh, get right into it. We're going to be getting uh, into the third part of Living with the Spirit, uh, still in Romans chapter 8. And uh, tonight we're going to be looking at verses 3 and 4 mainly. Uh, and before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, we come to you uh, with our minds and our hearts open. Uh, Lord, uh, let your uh, spirit and, and your son work through us. Um, show us the things that you have for us. Uh, if we're faithful, uh, we study and uh, we, we get in your word, Lord. Um, guide us along as we do this. Uh, Lord, I pray that tonight uh, what I speak about would be for your glory. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, people would stop and, and take a look at it uh, and definitely not just take my word for it. Uh, and we ask your name in these things. Amen. Uh, so we're going to read, uh, start off with Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. It says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Uh, I find those verses, uh, especially verse 4, uh, I think that it's, to me it's something that we should be taking really seriously, uh, what those verses tell us. Uh, not that we shouldn't take anything seriously in the scriptures, but, you know, sometimes you read something and you, you think, what really uh, is he trying to say to me uh, right now? Uh, and hopefully as we go through this tonight, uh, we can kind of see uh, some of that seriousness in these verses and then uh, maybe continue on with it again next week. But I think in verse 4, some might imagine... Uh, People might imagine in verse 4 that we're talking about salvation. Uh, so that the just requirement of the law might be filled, fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And I, though salvation might be in view here, I, I don't think that that is uh, the main driving point behind this verse. Yes, we have the spirit. Yes, uh, when you're saved, you have uh the spirit of Christ and the spirit of God in you. Uh, and yes, they do work, but work in you. Uh, but I think there's something to uh, more to who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, because as we've been discussing over the past several weeks, even though we're saved, we're believers and that's not going to change. Uh, there are times in our lives where we're not walking after the spirit. Uh, but walking after the flesh. Uh, and I, I think that when he's, as we go through this tonight, we'll look at this, but I, I think he's trying to key in on something here and tell us of something about who we are and what we have in Christ and in God. Uh, and in that, I think he's trying to get into a point of you're, you are someone and you are meant to be a certain way. Uh, and if you're not doing that, then you're walking according to the flesh and not according to the spirit, uh, which is why I say something like this verse. I think it should be taken seriously uh, to a Christian or to a believer. Um, so when it says in verse three for God, he's a continuation on from verse one. Uh, again, in talking about why there is no condemnation. So we can rightly say that God does not condemn regarding sin any longer. And this is absolutely true. Uh, and we should be very thankful for this on a daily basis, uh, if not more frequently. It's what the cross has accomplished. But I, I what I'm really trying to get across with this, with uh, these um, message over the past several weeks is that the cross is more uh, than just salvation. And that's I'm starting to learn that this, the salvation is like the uh, I don't want a little salvation because it's not little; it's huge. 
but it's it's like a, a the surface. So we keep talking about a sphere, and I love Jonathan Mitchell, and he, and he always uses the word sphere when he's talking about uh, in the different realms. So we have the spirit of Christ. We're living in that sphere. So I, I kind of picture that the edge of that sphere, or as deep as you want to go, like the atmosphere of the earth, um, is salvation. The atmosphere protects us. It holds in uh, it holds in the, the, the elements that we need to live. Uh, without the atmosphere, we would die. So it's in there. But when you get onto the surface of the earth, uh, where we live, and the things that happen on the surface of the earth, it, it's much, uh, it's much more detailed. When you get into the ground, it's even more detailed because it's full of nutrients and minerals. It's full of uh, elements and things that we we use uh, as we create things like vehicles and airplanes and laptop computers and TVs, and it it has all the nutrients in it uh, that supply our bodies. Um, so you, you eat food from good soil that's been treated properly and it nourishes you. Uh, you need these things. So there's a layer of protection or a layer that contains all this that you need. Uh, and that's kind of how I see salvation. It's a layer that I got, uh, but there's more going on down inside that layer. I hope that makes sense to you. Um, uh, so, the cross then, uh, the result of the cross, number one for us as a believer is that initial uh, salvation. And again, we're very thankful for it. It's, it's not going anywhere. And it, it is more than we can hope for and ask for. But God has more for us as a believer. There's a purpose for us. And I think we saw that when we were talking about in Christ Part of being in Christ is being somebody uh, who is going to let the Spirit work through them or let Christ work through them uh, for good, because we're made for good works. We saw that before several weeks ago, and and those are the things that should be driving us in our lives as people who are believers uh, or Christians. I think uh, more and more I like to use the word believer instead of Christian, but uh, you're, you are who you are in Christ. And you got to look at some of these things that I think that uh, maybe general Christianity looks at and it's kind of like, yeah, I'm saved. Uh, I have the spirit in me. And then they just keep going on and it never sinks in to see what's going on, uh, which is important. And I think part of that, I, I think a few weeks ago, I talked about uh, us having a responsibility. And I, I really think that we have a responsibility and there's an expectation uh, on God's part um, that we are going to act accordingly to who we are and let him, uh, let him do this work through us because his desire is that those people that are around us that don't yet see, will see it. Uh, and he knows who we are. So he's not expecting perfection in any way but he's looking for us uh, to let go and, and let him work. Uh, so if I break these, this verse down, um, uh, verses three and four, which we're going to do uh, right now. So God has uh, what he's done with salvation, what he's done through the cross and through his son. Uh, one of the things that Jesus did on this earth, as we read in, in verses three and four, was he did something so that we did not have uh, condemnation any longer. He condemned, he took on flesh, uh, and, and on the cross, uh, when he went to the grave, he left that behind when he rose. And, and that is a, a, an amazing work. But I think I said this a few weeks ago, and I'm gonna say it again today tonight because I'm uh, honestly truly believing this to be the case that Jesus also condemned sin in the flesh uh, even before he went to the cross um, condemning sin in the flesh on the cross had a uh, huge ramifications for us but when he was on this earth condemning sin in the flesh 
um, it was a, a picture, um, an image for us to see. Uh, so he did it in his life as a man, as he could be called the son of man, because he came in the flesh. And reading through the Gospels and trying to find examples, I think the best one is the temptation. Uh, and I'm going to read from that in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 uh, and 2. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He, le- he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. Now, I looked at the word famished, and I, I you know, did a little, uh, a very tiny short word study on it, but Jesus was truly famished. Uh, he didn't eat for a, a very extended uh, period of time, 40 days and 40 nights, uh, which is, is pretty uh, amazing in itself uh, for a human body not to eat uh, for that period. But he just went through that, and you know, sometimes uh, we read the, the temptation and we, we picture Jesus fasting 40 days and 40 nights. And then uh, at the end of it, uh, the adversary, Satan, the devil, whatever uh, you want to insert there, uh, that adversary tempted him with three temptations. And that was the temptation. Uh, but I don't think so. Uh, and we're going to see that that's not the case uh, in other books of the Gospels. But he spent 40 days and 40 nights with the adversary. Um, so he was in the company uh, of the devil or Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he was done, he was famished. And if we look at the word famished in the Greek, we read that it is a desperate situation. It uh, it has the idea that you labored really hard at something and expended immense amounts of energy to do it. And when you were done, you were famished to the point of passing out uh, or, or being unwell or unhealthy. And so he uh, went through that and that's what he felt when it was done. So we also see in the uh, in the temptation verses, you have to read them on your own, but he is described as a man, uh, Jesus is. And it's, it's not a using a general term or statement by referring to himself as a man. He was a man. And yes, he's the son of God. And so, yes, going on in his mind, in his spirit. I mean, you know what it says? He was led by the spirit. Uh, and he just followed the spirit where the spirit took him, which is God's spirit. And it, because we know he did everything and said anything, everything according to God, but he went up there and he had this behind him, which is obviously incredibly important. But the idea here is that he's still a man and he's going to show uh, something that can be done as a man, something that should be able to be done as a man, but, can't at this at this moment in our lives Um, but he did it so we understand we could see we talked last week about the different planes there's the spiritual plane and the the physical plane we know when jesus was on that mountain he was on the spiritual plane uh i don't think there was a moment of his time up there where he brought himself down uh, mentally onto the physical plane, or he probably wouldn't have gone 40 days and 40 nights without eating, and he wouldn't have been famished at the end. Um, but he had his mind in the right place um, as he dealt with this. So despite all that, he stayed, his mind is on the spiritual and not on the physical. So, you know, you think about that, and you think, well, that's exactly what Paul in Colossians chapter 3 is telling us. He's saying to set your mind on the things above. We set our mind on the heavenly, on the spiritual, on that other plane, not on the physical. Uh, And I think by Jesus doing that, it shows that if you keep your mind where it's supposed to be, and for us, of course, we would never make it 40 days and 40 nights with our minds on the spiritual plane. I I think of my own self, and it's it's hard enough to get through... um, you know, pile on minutes on top of each other. Uh, you know, I can be reading my Bible and 
is something pops into my head that's, you know, about work or about something else I have to do for the day, uh, you know, and maybe this is stupid to admit to you, but there are times when I'm praying uh, and the same thing happens. And before you know it, I'm not praying. And I have to stop myself and say, wait a minute, you're praying and your mind is wandering. It's very, it takes a lot of focus and effort to keep yourself where you need to be. And, and if you are open, the spirit will help you with that. And of course we know that, you know, I'm hoping that when my mind wanders and I'm praying or something that, you know, God doesn't necessarily see all those things and that the spirit is interceding for me, uh, saying the proper words or gets what I'm trying to get across. But that is a picture of what, what Paul's talking to. And the more I look at things like that, the more I see what Paul's talking about when he says to imitate him as he imitates Christ. Uh, and I think at least once he says, imitate God directly. And so you see these things that you can see in the life of Jesus. And, and I have to think that uh, Paul didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but he, uh, the only time Paul saw him that we know of anyways, uh, is when uh, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. But there's, there's, you got to know that Paul uh, went off uh, if you're free for a few years before he really got into his ministry um, and he got things revealed to him and he saw things uh, as the spirit led him. Uh, he, he hung out with people uh, like the apostles, at least some of them. Uh, Luke was with Paul frequently. Uh, and I'm sure that he and Paul gleaned things and stories from Luke about, you know, I remember when, we went to this town or that town, you know, Jesus said this or that. And, and Paul saw those things. And so he wasn't an Island by himself. He, he got information from others. Uh, so in, in down in chapter four or verse 11 of chapter four of Matthew, it says the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. And why did they need to wait on him? Because, he just suffered uh, a long ordeal uh, with someone who was totally against him, someone that was trying to get him uh, to succumb to the physical and fleshly pleasures and desires. And it took work. He was exhausted and he needed attention. Uh, it, I think it's in Luke. I just read from Matthew, but uh, I think in Luke it says that they came. It's a little more detailed. Uh, they didn't just wait on him, but it, I think it goes on to say that he needed uh, he needed that. And it, it should not be hard for us to imagine this. Um, it's hard for me to imagine going 40 days and 40 nights without eating and spending that much time with the devil. Uh, but it shouldn't be hard for us to imagine what it's like to be totally physically and mentally exhausted because things have happened to all of us in our lives that, uh, that, that happens with. And you know, by the end of the day, you're just like, wow. And all you can do is go home. And as we say, crash on the couch and you fall asleep and wake up at midnight and go back to bed in your bed. But that's, that's where Jesus was after these temptations. Uh, and it wasn't just the three things. Um, if you if you read these, um, I could have sworn I wrote the verses in here, but I didn't. But if you read them, it says that he, he went up to be tempted. He was tempted the entire time. We don't know all the temptations. Uh, and like I said, there was a lot of dialogue. There was a lot going on up there. The three that we read uh, are important because they, they mainly have to do with the comforts uh, of the flesh, eating, um, being king over everything. Uh, those are right at the end, and I think those are there for our benefit. But we don't know everything else that went through. But I can only imagine that every ounce of Jesus' flesh uh, was screaming for relief and he was able to keep that under control. Uh, so if you go to Philippians chapter three, um, Paul, uh, we're not going to turn there, but Paul is talking about himself. 
and who he wants to be and the race he's running. And as I was doing this, I just, I inserted Jesus' name. And you might think that sounds crazy, but that's exactly, I think, uh, part of what Paul wants us to see, what he means by imitate. He is striving the same as Jesus was striving and running a race. Jesus was put on this earth for a purpose, and he fulfilled that purpose uh, perfectly. But it doesn't mean that it was simple and easy for him because he was the son of God. If it was, it would defeat the entire purpose um, of him coming in the likeness or coming into uh, a human body and being born from a child and being raised in the human body and experiencing things uh, that humans feel in the emotions. Um, but he finished his race. He accomplished what was to be accomplished um, to the benefit of all creation uh, and of mankind. So Paul's wasn't accomplished, and he said it wasn't. Ours was, it will not be accomplished by the end. Um, but as Paul says, trying to get to that finish line or trying to get the end, and that final, or at least the center of it, I believe, was the cross. And of course, we have the death uh, and the, the, the burial and the resurrection. We can wrap those up into the cross work, but the, the point of going to the cross in the flesh and, and leaving the flesh behind, uh, which we're going to take a look at right now, um, was key. So the key point tonight that I have uh, that I want to get into, and we're going to settle on this for a little bit uh, and then continue on with a little bit and then uh, go on to next week. But we say that Jesus, uh, he went to the grave and he, he left the flesh behind in the grave. And it just occurred to me a while ago that did he really leave his flesh in the grave? What is Paul talking about in Romans chapter 8 about flesh? Uh, it seems to me that if we read the accounts in the Gospels of what happened, uh, when, uh, when the ladies went to the grave, they looked in the grave, the tomb was open, and there was no body in it. It was gone. So we have to think that Jesus did not leave his body in the grave. He was raised up. He used that body, and he left the grave. He appeared to people after his resurrection in the very same body that was crucified and went in the grave. Uh, and how do we know that? Because even though they didn't recognize him at first because he was, uh, there was something different about him, but Thomas touched Jesus. Jesus, well, you know, he welcomed them because Thomas was doubting. You know, put your hand to my side. Look at the holes in my hands. Look at the holes in my feet. I mean, he, that wasn't just an image or an appearance. That was Jesus. Uh, and I think this matters in this in this uh, study uh, because we often believe, you know, I, I, over the past couple of years, I've read some authors that talk about escapism and Christianity uh, are escape artists uh, as a whole. We, uh, the majority of Christianity believes that this earth at some point is going to be torched and burned to a crisp, that everything on it is going to be completely gone uh, that it's just going to be basically destroyed so it can be remade, uh, that we are all, if you, if you, even if you look at the chick tracks, they, they show a, a man in the grave, and the man is like partly sitting up, but coming out of him is his soul, and, and the body stays there. And that's the picture that we have. And, and Christianity cannot wait to leave our bodies behind and to leave this earth behind. And... You know, the real news is this earth is not going anywhere. Uh, you know, we know that there are trees in California in the mountains. I can't remember what they're called, some kind of pine. They're, they're hideous little trees. Uh, they're not really big, but those trees, uh, they can date them by going into the core and, and looking at the rings. Some of those trees are up to 6,000 years old. Those 
things aren't leaving. They're going to be here. Now, will it someday be a point when we don't wake up to the news of earthquakes and hurricanes and tsunamis that wipe out entire uh, islands and cultures? Yes, I believe that that is someday going to be the case. But it doesn't mean that the earth has to disappear or be completely wiped out. No more than it means that my body uh, is, is not going to be remade uh, and I'm still going to look like Daniel Joseph Haley III. Uh, I'm still going to have fingers and feet. What will I look like exactly? I, I don't know. But I do know that I'm still going to be who I am. And I think that's one place where Christianity misses out because they really honestly think that, you know, I, I don't know if, if they think a spiritual body means, uh, you know, like a in Star Trek where a, a being comes through the wall of the ship and floats around the bridge and it's just a little ray of light uh, and speaks with a booming voice because it's some spiritual body. But we are going to have a spiritual body, but it's going to be this body. Uh, I once uh, a couple years ago, I gave something about Adam and, and the thought that uh, Adam, when he was in the garden, uh, did not look just like a human being. I mean, he, he looked like a human being as far as shape. Uh, his face, I think, was the same. But he shone. He was bright. Uh, and and I, I think that, you know, when he was first made, that was there. But as he learned and walked with God, that became greater as he learned and matured uh, in God. And unfortunately, he decided that he uh, was going to be like God and, and God sent him out of the garden. Um, but when Adam left the garden, what did he look like? I think he looked like a man like we see today. What he had before was left behind in the garden and he left the garden like a man. Uh, and I think it's similar to Jesus. He left uh, what he had uh, in heaven, in glory, and he came down into a man. And when he raised in his bodily flesh, it is a point. I think it's important for us to see that and realize that I think uh, and I think I'm, I'm right, at least at this moment. I think that that's, that's the case. Uh, I know that when I die someday, uh, you're not going to want to open up my grave and look at it, you know, 10 years after, because it's going to be a disgusting mess. Um, it dried up and shriveled. But that, you know, it is going to be remade. And that is what uh, I'm going to see. When, when I finally am resurrected, I'm going to see me in a beautiful, glorious, spiritual state. But I think that when I walk among everyone else who's there, uh, if I come across somebody that I knew in life and they were saved, and they, I think they'll be able to see me and say, hey, there's Dan Haley. And I'll be able to look at them and say the same thing. Uh, and I think it's going to be an amazing thing. Um, so going through that, it has a point. So when we read verses three and four, what is God saying? Uh, I'll read it again. It says, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemns sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Uh, so what are we talking about here when we talk about flesh? Um, I'm going to read verse 3 again from the Passion Translation, which is a Bible I, I came across about a year ago, and I have to say I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, but it says, for God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. God sent his son in human form to identify with human weakness. Clothed with humanity, God's son gave his body to be a sin offering so that God could once and for all condemn the guilt and power of sin. 
and the message calls that. So here in the Passion Translation, we see that it's the weakness of human nature. Uh, and in the Message Bible, uh, he calls it the fractured human nature. And I really liked that fractured human nature. And the reason is, is because if something's fractured, uh, to me, that means it wasn't always fractured. It wasn't meant to be fractured. If someone builds a, a, a beautiful sculpture uh, or a, a, a clay pot or um, a pottery and, and they make it really nice and it's beautiful and they, they glaze it or they do pictures on it and it's sitting up on your mantle uh, and your cat runs along and knocks it off and it cracks and breaks and you uh, go get some Gorilla Glue and you put it back together real nice as best as you can uh, and you, you look at it and you think, wow, that looks nice, but there's a fracture in it. Uh, and I think that's exactly correct to look at it that way. We uh, were made for a purpose and we're fractured. You know, you can't look at my body and see it's fractured, but my nature is fractured. Uh, it's broken. And that happened because of Adam. Uh, and so we were designed to be something more. And before when I said, and, and as I said before in weeks past, that Jesus did more in the flesh, uh, condemning uh, the flesh. He condemned human nature uh, in its fractured state when he was in the flesh on this earth uh, because he listened and only did and only spoke and only did what God did through him. And that is a picture that Paul has for us to see of what we're supposed to be. Uh, and I, I think it's really important to look at it that way. Um, so we look at the Greek word for flesh and here it's, it's sarx. Now sarx occurs uh, almost every single time. Uh, I didn't thoroughly look at it, but I only found a couple places where we we're talking about skin or flesh and it uses a, a different word, but mostly it's flesh. But it's interesting that the flesh that Sarx means, uh, it's not my skin. So when you look at me and see me, uh, that's not what Sarx is. Uh, it is not the outer covering. It references the meat, the inner workings of any living being, because it's also used uh, in reference to animals. Uh, in, in uh, I didn't look it up, but it said in the commentary that in, in places in the Old Testament where you read about the flesh or sacrificing or uh, uh, eating the flesh of an animal, sarx is the word. Of course, if you're in the Septuagint, sarx is the word. Uh, I didn't look it up what it was in Hebrew. But the idea is it's not what you see on the outside. So it can be implied, according to Strong's, to the inner workings of a human being, uh, not necessarily uh, my muscles working. It can uh, imply the inner being, the person, who I am. Uh, of course, I don't believe that, uh, and some of you might believe differently, but I don't believe that I'm, you know, flesh, uh, the outer covering, and then as we see here, the sarks or the flesh inside, uh, and then inside of all that is a, is a, uh, a soul. Uh, I believe, as we read in Genesis, um, uh, that I am a living soul. So all of it together uh, makes me who I am, which is a living soul. And so when uh, that goes even further, when, when I'm raised uh, into resurrection, uh, into what God has me for in the future, it's my soul. It's me um, that will appear. Uh, but uh, the thoughts and intents, the passions uh, of us, who we are, um, all those things make up who we are. That is our nature. Uh, and and when, I think what Paul is talking about here uh, it, with the human nature in Romans 3 and 4 is it's who you are, but fractured. Your fractured nature, which cannot operate uh, the way it's supposed to operate, the way God intended for you to operate because it's fractured, that has to be corrected. Um, and I think that is what 
gets left behind in the grave. That's what Jesus left behind for us. That old nature. I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to say that, well, Jesus had the old nature. He, he didn't have the old nature. He had uh, what, what God had for him, uh, which was not the old nature, but he took that on uh, himself so that he could show it could be defeated. And then he finally, uh, once and for all, defeated it on the cross. So in Romans, in, in the same chapter down in verses uh, 22 and 23, it says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. The redemption of our bodies, not the replacement of our bodies, not your body rots in the ground and you come up just your soul and you get a brand new body. You are going to be completely renewed uh, by God for the purposes that he has for us someday uh, beyond this existence uh, in the physical plane. Um, but we groan. I groan. Uh, I've been having a lot of pack problems lately and it's sometimes it's really bad. Last, uh, uh, last Saturday after work, I, I, I left early cause it was, I think the worst it's been. And on the way home, I was groaning and it crossed my mind cause I've been studying this someday. My back is not going to hurt and I'm not going to groan because I am going to be redeemed. My body is going to be redeemed and I am not going to have to go through that anymore. And so don't we sometimes as believers groan and think to ourselves, I can't wait for that day. Uh, I have in the past uh, and I'm sure other people have in the past, especially if you go through serious illness uh, and you make it through and you, it's got to cross your mind uh, as someone who believes that someday that's going to happen. So it's, our bodies are part of creation. I'm part of creation. Uh, when he made the, the light and the dark and, and the, the earth and separated the waters and he made fish and plants uh, and animals and the four-footed beast uh, and all the fish of the sea, all of that was made. And we were made, humanity was made with that. Uh, though human, it, it was... Uh, we were set on kind of a separate plane from the rest of that because we were supposed to subdue it and be over it. Um, but we were part of the creation. We weren't separate from it. So when Paul talks about creation here, I believe that he's also talking about us, even as he says we ourselves. Um, he's covering all aspects. So there's no escape from the earth, uh, and there's no escape uh, from who we are. We're always going to be who we are. But that nature that we have that's fractured, that's broken, is going to be permanently renewed. Uh, I know sometimes Lisa and I talk about, about this and about uh, what we're going to look like someday and and we've talked back and forth about it before. And, and I know before when I've expressed this with her, she gets disappointed. And she's like, seriously, I want to be different because there's things about me. I don't like There's, you know, I don't want to be exactly like I'm going to be. And, and you're not going to be exactly like you're going to be. But, you know, you think if you're someone who's balding, you might have a full head of hair. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but you're still going to be who you are. And that's why I, I think it's so important for us while we're here to get this and understand why we're here and let that spirit work in us. Because we need to allow that to happen uh, so God could fulfill his purposes in us while we're here and in the future. And I think by having the, the idea that you're going to leave all this behind and it's, it's all going to be completely different, it kind of takes away from uh, the mindset we have while we're here of what we're supposed to be working on. Uh, and I find that very interesting uh, for myself anyway. So the tomb was empty. Jesus got up and he left that tomb 
Adam and Eve walked out of the garden as bodies, the same bodies they had when they were in the garden, uh, but their nature had been damaged. Um, at that point, we could say beyond repair, uh, but to them, it might've been beyond repair at that moment, uh, maybe in even the rest of their lives, but God had a plan uh, to fix that and to make it things like they were supposed to be. So Jesus was raised to newness of life. Uh, he returned to the original concept uh, of, of what we should be, uh, and that's a new nature. So every time Paul says something like, you're a new creature, you're a new creation, uh, old things are gone, you, I think it's important to, to remember in our minds that this is what Paul's talking about. This is what the cross, this is what Jesus was here to show us. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verses 16 and 17, reading from the, the Passion Translation, it says, So then, from now on, we have a new perspective that refuses to evaluate people merely by their outward appearances, for that's how we once viewed the Anointed One. But no longer do we see him with limited human insight. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the old order has vanished, and behold, everything is fresh and new. See, fresh and new. It doesn't mean destroyed and recreated. It means you took something that existed, and you changed it, and you made it fresh and new. Uh, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, making your bed. It's, you wash the sheets, you take them outside. If you go outside and do that outside, it's just got the freshest smell to it. You put them on your bed and you call it, it's fresh and new bedding. You didn't take your bedding out and burn it in a fire uh, to a crisp and then, you know, sew up a whole new bed, bed spread to look exactly like the one you just burned. You made that one fresh and new. So, what the Passion Translation calls outward appearances, uh, that's the sarks, the flesh, the fractured human nature. New and fresh uh, is the same original creation that's made fresh like it was supposed to be. So let's read again uh, Romans 8, chapter 4. It says, So now every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the Anointed One living His life in us, and we are free to live, not according to our flesh, but by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. So we can see here that our fractured human nature, and that's, that's what I'm going to uh, phrase this as, just like, like the Message Bible does. Uh, our fractured human nature does not want us to live by the Spirit. I won't say it doesn't allow us, uh, because... We uh, set that nature aside, that fractured nature aside, and let the Spirit work through us. But that fractured nature is constantly battling to gain control uh, and to not want us or allow us or let us to uh, give in to the Spirit. But we're free to live. That's... I, it makes a lot of sense to me when he says things like free uh, other places. Paul uses that, that we've been set free. Uh, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. You know, sometimes uh, years ago, I used to think free from what, you know, the, and, and again, Christianity would say, well, free from sin. Okay. Well, I'm free from sin, but what, what does that mean? Because I'm still here and I'm still sinning. What does it mean? It's if you just say I'm free from sin, that that just means that, yeah, someday I'm going to go to heaven, and I'm not going to have any more sin. And that's true, and that's awesome, and it's great. But what does it mean right now? What am I free from? I am free from my fractured nature. Free to let the Spirit work in me so that I can accomplish things through the Spirit, just like Jesus did when he let the Spirit work in him. Uh, and and he accomplished the works that he was made for 
just like in Ephesians, it says we were made for something. We were made for good works. And the only way to let those happen is to let the spirit work. Uh, I once had a conversation with me, uh, someone years ago, um, and it was philosophical and, and he started talking about, uh, we were talking about, uh, um, salvation. And he mentioned, you know, he didn't believe in altruism because, you know, philosoph so philosophically, it doesn't matter what you say. You're doing something good for somebody, but even though you don't know it subconsciously in your mind, you're doing it somehow in some way for yourself. You know, at the time I thought, well, that is a horrible way to look at life. Um, but now that I'm looking at this, I'm starting to realize that there's some truth to that. Again, I think I said this last week and maybe even the weeks before, but we, we do good things in life as, as people. Uh, and people who aren't saved or who aren't believers do good things in life. Uh, and there might be times where they do good things in life and they're honestly really not thinking of how it benefits them. Um, but there's always that driving force in the fractured nature of why you do things and they're for a certain reason and it's it's for the self uh in some way shape or form and i think when jesus uh uh i forget who he's talking to exactly but he says that uh um he, i think he's talking about love you know he says even uh even tax collectors love their 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 uh, relationship their their brothers and sisters so what difference does it do if you do it and i think jesus is trying to drive a point there you can do the same things as the unbelievers are doing and the people in the world are doing uh the good things but what what is it leading to uh, we need to make sure, we need to work at letting it to make sure that the things we're doing, the good works that God had for us to do, which very well uh, may include uh, volunteering in your community, um, giving to the poor, uh, working at a soup kitchen and feeding people who are, are, you know, don't have that advantage, or where there's a natural disaster and you, you go and you, you give backpacks full of supplies or, or things for children because everything they had was lost. Those are all great things. The intent of the spirit behind those things makes them even better because when your intent uh, is allowing the spirit to work through you, that is going to show, especially when you're helping someone person to person uh, or speaking someone person to person. Um, Cause God is going to use that. He's going to use that to draw that person in. Uh, and, and I'll even go so far as to say, even the people that uh, aren't believers, aren't saved that are still uh, dead according to God. I think that when they do things, uh, God even can use those things to show who he is. Uh, because when someone is without God, it's the father that draws them, Jesus said, uh, and he draws them through uh, Jesus. But when he's drawing them, uh, you know, what if it's a person that doesn't live by any safe people? What if it's someone who lives in the, in the backwoods of the Amazon? Uh, because we know there are cultures there who've had little contact with the outside. God is doing things to show people who he is. Uh, and he's working. As Jesus said, he's still working now. So uh, that point about altruism might not be, uh, even though it seems somewhat pessimistic way to view life, uh, it's not necessarily um, completely wrong, I don't think. And, and that's why uh, letting the spirit work through us is so important um, because it, it keeps it, it, it keeps it pure. It makes sure that it's the work that God has for us and that it's somehow not the work uh, that I have for me. Uh, because as soon as that happens, of course, someone else might benefit from it, um, but it, it's not doing the drawing work that God intends. Uh, and that, you know, that's kind of a, uh, a lot of why we're still here. It's kind of like when you get saved, God doesn't just whisk you away off the face of the earth. He leaves you here for a reason. 
And it's not so you can stumble along uh, in the old nature or in the fractured nature um, and, and still live with the system that we're in. It's so that you can uh, rise above it. You know, they, you know, I've heard Christian songs that talk about you're an overcomer. Um, and, you know, I think the overcoming is by me letting God work in me. That's, that's what makes me an overcomer, uh, if I am one. So what is, we see in these verses, what is the law of sin and death? Uh, and I'm going to try to get through this here in the next few minutes because I think I'm almost done, uh, and I really want to get through this point. Um, we are free from the law. It says in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And then in verse 3, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. And then down in verse four, it says, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now we can view this uh, if we choose, um, and it would be right to uh, include uh, the Mosaic law into this. But I, I really honestly believe it goes so much deeper than the Mosaic Law and can be viewed so much simpler than the Mosaic Law. Uh, and I use Romans 5 as, as the basis for this thought. We have the first Adam and the last Adam. The first Adam could do, uh, he completely failed. And the last Adam changed it all. And he was victorious. The first Adam, I believe, brought us the law of sin and death. And you say, well, how can that be? Because there was no Mosaic law or no covenants or none, you know, there wasn't even the Ten Commandments yet. The law of sin and death, uh, I think, can be simply viewed as, you know, in the fractured state, uh, the fractured uh, uh, human nature, or if you just want to call it human nature, um, or the flesh, as we read in most English translations, that the law of that is sin and death. Uh, and I think it's that simple to, to view it that way. The second Adam freed us from the law of sin and death. And, and what was that law that, that Adam began? Because I, I see it as Adam, uh, that law started with him and it just got bigger and bigger uh, and just snowballed into what it, we have today. Uh, which is, is a massive system uh, that uh, we should be not be living according to because it brings sin and death. Uh, God says in Genesis 3.22 that uh, he, he's saying, look at man has eaten from the tree of knowledge. And there's the tree of life there too. And if we let him continue eating from this tree of knowledge, it's just going to get worse and worse. And then he's going to live forever because he'll be able to keep eating from that tree of life and imagine what things will be like. So that's when he sends them out. Uh, and what did he tell them would happen if they ate? He says, you will die if you eat of that tree. Uh, that is what happened. They ate of it, and we die as a result. So they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and that turned it into a law of sin and death. Because if you read in Romans chapter 8, it says the law was weakened by the flesh. So there was something there, and it wasn't weak, and it was right. And it was the way it was supposed to be. But in order for that to happen through us, it's weakened. And so God did something to change that so that law wouldn't be weakened. And that's part of what the freeing is. That's part of what the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us is. Because it happens through the Spirit the way it should have happened, and it becomes the law, as we saw in, in also in, in uh, uh, verses 8 through 4, um, the law of the Spirit, the law of life. It's not that the law that 
was there originally, or the idea that was there originally, or as I think it was Mr. Woos last week I read who said that it was uh, not necessarily a, a law, like legal written law, but a guiding principle, something that led us, um, uh, that's what it was. And to have that law in an imperfect state uh, just causes sin and death, and you can never fulfill it. Uh, in our current state. And that was the purpose. That's part of the purpose, what the cross was for uh, that I was talking about in the beginning. Uh, the other thing I'd like to look at, even in, in verse 17 of Genesis chapter two is, you know, I, I wonder sometimes, was that a threat, a punishment? If you eat that, I'm going to kill you. I, I, or was it a statement, a fact? I think it was a statement of fact. I think it was, if you eat this, this is what's going to happen to you. Not because I'm going to stand over you and club your, your head in until it's smashed, but because if you eat this without being fully mature, you're not going to be able to handle it. And it's not going to be, it's not going to have a good outcome for you. Um, so they brought death. They brought sin and they brought death because in the fractured human nature, all that could come out of that law, uh, is sin and death. And so what Paul is saying is that we've been freed from that. So the law itself is not made, is not weak. We make it weak when we try uh, to do it on our own. Uh, that we can say the law is caused by us if we're living after the flesh and not after the spirit. So I think the importance of that statement by Paul is that, yes, you are in the spirit. Yes, you are saved. But you must work to live after the spirit because every time you're not living after the spirit, you're living after the flesh and you're weakening the law of the spirit, the law of life, uh, and turning it into a law um, of sin and death. So the law of sin and death, uh, at the moment, I'm seeing as it's, it's humanity's to own alone, uh, nobody else. So, and I think, and, and I didn't read Jonathan Mitchell from here, but in his parentheses in these verses, he calls it a system. He says it's a system of the world created by humanity, and only the spirit can break us free from it. And uh, that's where we're going to stop tonight, I believe. Let me just scroll down here. That's it. Uh, and next week we'll uh, continue on still uh, in Romans chapter 8 uh, and, and keep looking at life in the Spirit.